to start off, we've got Andrew Reeves. And um, Andrew's a social scientist, um, a teacher, and a community activist. Um, his work over the past decade has focused on, on community level action for sustainability. Andrew was the co founder of Transition Leicestershire, uh, Green Fox Community Energy, and Leicestershire Community Culture Design Course. And Andrew's going to, paper's going to, or talk is going to explore and further develop the bridge between permaculture theory and practice in the domains of design and education through critical engagement with current uses of the four commonly used aspects of permaculture thinking design tools, design frameworks, ethics, and principles. So we're going to, we've got three presenters and we'll run in 20, 20 minutes for each of these 10 minutes for questions, and then if we have any time at the end, Thank you. Do we have a clicky, clicky thing? Mm. Uh, in the world that we want, this technology works better, doesn't it? Has, it? has anyone been around people making the PDFs appear full screen? Has anyone yeah. going to view? Well, I can't do it. Yes, please, like PDF. That's what I did before. And then, okay. It should happen, <laughs> and it doesn't happen. Okay, no matter. Um, hello all, thank you for joining us. Um, so, what I'm going to do is kind of share a journey, mostly a mental journey, that I've been on. Um, and you may or may not find it interesting and relevant. I suspect some of you will, wow, find it fascinating. Some of you will go, this is ridiculous and a waste of my time, and leave, and that's okay. Um, so I'm just throwing out stuff that I've been quite engaged by, and just harvest the bits that you enjoy. That's my suggestion for you. So basically, yes, it's an invitation to put on your, your thinking hat. Um, if this morning, I don't know if you've met thinking hats. I'm the kind of person who likes thinking hats. This says a lot about what this talk will be about. Um, the, the yellow thinking hat is all about being positive, what can be, opportunity in the future. The black thinking hat is the opposite. It's a bit cautious and negative. So... <coughs> In part, what I'm going to do is like the black hat compared to Jeff Lawton's uh, yellow hat this morning. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, so, I have a background in, in research. Um, I do a bit of teaching. I'm interested in how we design. And so, I'm more in that domain rather than the specific aspects of design. And during my permaculture diploma, which I was doing from 2011 until 2015, um, I couldn't help but keep on questioning what I was doing. Was this even valid? Was this appropriate? Was this useful? Was I wasting my time? So I did a lot of reflection. And so this talk is partly harvesting some of those reflections and partly some stuff I've been doing more recently to try and make something coherent out of it. So I'm going to look at four things used in permaculture education. So principles, ethics, tools, and kind of processes or, or design frameworks. Um, and I'm going to kind of ask some critical questions of them. So, do they fit how I understand permaculture and the reasons why I appreciate it? Are they actually valid? Are they useful? And how could they be improved? I'll try and throw in some ideas around how this links to how we educate people using these concepts at the end. Whoop. So, if you love pictures, uh, I find this one very helpful. It's by a guy who's here, Raphael Sasberg, so I presume he's not here in the room. Um, but he was trying to unpick, what is permaculture? Which is a question we have often been asked, perhaps. And he identified lots of different elements. Um, so, you know, there's a common world view, um, there's a social movement, and then there's a bit of a split. So there's a kind of a, a sort of almost like a traditional style of permaculture, which is concerned with particular activities you might do, especially on the land. And then there's another aspect, which is a very pragmatic kind of design system that applies sort of a systems approach to any design situation and comes up with solutions that are tailored to those particular circumstances. My own interest is much more along the right hand side than the left hand side and so when I, and I already had a background in sustainability before engaging with permaculture, so for me asking myself is this permaculture useful for me in my life, I was much more interested in exploring this this side. I'm sorry, can we have having a conversation with 
It's okay for me, so I guess. No, that's all right. There's just how many hours of yeah. I don't know if we can do anything about the speakers. Maybe I'll let Tiara try. Is it okay if I continue whilst this happens? Otherwise, time will be short. Okay, so I guess the guiding question I was interested in, um, you know, looking at my personal relationship with permaculture, was this. So, is there such a thing as a general way to design sustainable systems? And is permaculture that? Is it doing that already? Uh, is it a valid system? Is it actually a practical system to apply? So I was trying to explore that territory. Um, so these were the elements I was exploring, so the principles, the ethics, the tools, and various design processes. Um, I apologise if these are not familiar, this is mostly a talk that will work for you if you've engaged with this already, so I'm not going to explain them now, but I will go into a little more detail later. So, I'm interested in framing permaculture as being about sustainability, which has things to do with the resources that we use, the energy we use, people side, economic side, but also within sustainability, the idea of systems that are resilient, that are adaptable, because that's part of the kind of permaculture approach as well. And when I say a systemic perspective, these are some of the things I'm, I'm thinking of. So it's seeing the relationships between things and seeing how things emerge, noticing the boundaries of the system and the relationships with the external environment. There's a lot within permaculture that seems to be about taking that perspective. And lots of people who care a lot about sustainability don't necessarily think in that way. And so I think one of the contributions of permaculture is to offer that style of thinking to sustainability problems. And so I was interested to see how well permaculture is actually doing that. Um, so here you get just my reflections, really. So principles, do they embody a systemic approach? Certainly, if you read David Holmgren's Principles and Pathways, that's explicitly what he is trying to do. Um, however, does, you know, he summarised it with 12 principles. Does it help people when you explain these principles to actually take on that outlook? I think that's an interesting question. Um, there's a paper by Peter Harper where he was quite uh, critical of permaculture, where he was saying, well, you can try and tell people some principles, but mostly, if they're new, they don't get it. And probably, they'll use them poorly. And he's saying you need experience to actually use them wisely. So he's saying principles as an educational tool at first are not very helpful, which is interesting. From my own experience at the diploma, I found certainly it was often the case when I didn't want to use a principle. So you know, a small and slow solution in a system where you can make step-by-step -step improvements is valuable. Sometimes you need to switch to a whole different system because the system won't let you make small improvements. And so sometimes I didn't do that. Um, using kind of multi-functional elements sometimes has a lot of value, um, but sometimes you want a specialist tool that does the job well. And so again, it's not always right, I think. And so there seems to be some kind of overarching, uh, I'm calling it design wisdom, some broader perspective, I think, that aids our decision making. It isn't just blindly following these 12 rules. Um, my idea about what that is, is viewing the systems we're looking at as systems and bringing in the permaculture ethics to help us make decisions. So that, for me, that, that told me that there was something overarching that these principles are trying to guide us towards, but taken on their own, they won't, they won't get us there. And that, again, that's what David Holmgren said when he introduced them. <coughs> Oops. Just, this is an aside, it's more a question to ruminate on. Uh, the UK convergence a year ago, someone in, in a queue for dinner said to me, can you imagine a right-wing permaculturalist? <laughs> and, uh, and I looked around, and I've been looking around you know, this event as well, I'm like, hmm, maybe not, you know? And apologies if people you know, in the room are right-wing and you feel a bit isolated now. Um, so, you know, do, I, I think there's probably a thing where the permaculture principles, as expressed by David Holmgren, do embody 
maybe a kind of a left-wing liberal understanding of natural systems. You know, we, we see our own values reflected in the world around us. I think a right-wing person looking at nature may have pulled out a few different things. And so, is permaculture really a design approach for everyone, or is it aimed towards you know, a social movement with a particular worldview, with a particular way of working? I think it probably is. Um, and maybe that's okay. Um, it would be a very incoherent movement, perhaps, if that wasn't the case. Um, but if we talk about reaching everyone and being inclusive, I think there may be some fundamental barriers there. Anyway, that's the thing to reflect on. Um, I found this helpful. So I looked at the principles, the 12 Holmgren ones, and I mapped them in a Venn diagram. So the overlapping areas are where both things apply. And so I noticed some of them seem to be about how you design, the process of design, some to be about the properties of the system that you design, and some are about the attitudes you bring as a designer. And I found that helpful because then it gives you a sense of which things are kind of absolute things you're aiming for, and which things are more negotiable. You know, I think the bottom left is, captures a lot of the common understanding of sustainability. We don't want waste, we want things to be renewable, we want to harvest energy. We want to get yields. Um, permaculture's contribution about design process is a lot about observation, looking for patterns, the commitment to integrate. Um, and yeah, I think when we view the principles in that way, we, we can be maybe a bit smarter about how we use them. And I think you know, the attitudes, and you know, Bill Mollison was very strong for that, you know, coming up with these interesting phrases that stop you and make you think. You know, I think often these work because they point us towards a systemic understanding. Saying the problem is the solution is highlighting you know, the problem of this energy in the system that wants to do something and maybe we can find a way of reorganizing the system to make it work. Or Everything Gardens is saying that you know, everything is having an influence in the system. So these kind of you know, unlock our thinking and they're complementary to these more formal understandings of what is happening or how to do it. And we could bring in other, other things as well. What I found when I reflected on, on this was, for me, two very important things are not quite captured in principles. One is about the external environment. So like David Holmgren in his talk was talking a lot about phases of permaculture and responsiveness to big geopolitical stuff, really shaping what we do. We're not guided towards that when we look at the 12 principles, I think. We often bring it in anyway. But I think fit with the external environment is a big thing. And also time, you know, systems have a history and systems have a future and they have patterns of how they evolve over time. And again, we, the principles don't guide us towards that as they are stated. So for me, for my use of them, I'd want to add those extra things. How are we doing for time, speaking of that? Okay, hey, maybe I'll be okay. Um, so ethics. Uh, without ethics, we just have understanding systems and designing. They're important for permaculture. Do they embody a systemic understanding? I'd say yes, broadly. You know, so earth care, people care, it's recognizing you know, interdependence. Um, fair shares is about recognizing kind of flows and, of energy, and sometimes we have more, and it's a good thing to sh share that with those people or whatever who have less. There are interesting things about how we use them though, you know, so often in ethical judgments, let, let's say it's a, a carbon footprint analysis, you know, we've all traveled to be here. Uh, if it's a snapshot judgment, we might say, traveling to be here, one ton of CO2, no. However, a more kind of systemic kind of pathway judgment would say, well, this is contributing to you know, knowledge exchange, this could let, make lots of things happen. Over time, this could be, you know, for moral good. Um, I presume we've all made that judgment because we're here. Um, so there are different ways of answering ethical questions that could be more systemic, I think. Are they practical? Um, I find it interesting that they're so wonderfully vague. Um, and you can fundamentally disagree with someone, but both agree that caring for people is good. Um, so, you know, we can say things, we all believe in people care, and then actually find that one person supports a war, another person is against it. For the same people care reason. Fascinating. So, you know, it's helpful to have an umbrella. Um, it's helpful to be reminded to check against our own moral compass, even if it may be different to someone else's. But in group settings, that requires work for consensus, I think. 
Um, and also with moral judgments, you know, I do teaching around how people engage with sustainability, and the common theme there is that we always kind of justify our own actions against our own understanding of what is good. And so it's unlikely we will challenge ourselves effectively. What we'll do is say, oh, I want to do this. Oh, and it's good. It's good because of people care. Yeah, it's fine. So we need to be challenged, I think, to use these well. And you know, design tools can do that. Doing a carbon footprint of your journey can do that. Getting feedback from your friends. You know, Am I doing people care here? Mm, have you thought about this? So designing in feedback, I think, is an important way of using ethics to make them more tangible. Uh, design tools. Tools are there to help you. Um, so I'm not sure. Who, who uses design tools when they design things? How familiar is this? So about half people in the room. OK. Um, so they're there to help you make decisions. They can, I think, helpfully kind of embed permaculture thinking without you needing to understand theory. You know, someone can just use a tool and implicitly they are doing permaculture and they fit with particular parts of a design process. So, how well are tools guiding us towards sustainability and a systemic approach? So these are some of the tools that I encountered during my diploma. Um, so we might make a map, uh, we might think about zones or sectors or microclimates and so on. Um, I observed that the, a lot of the tools you're invited to use during a diploma, in the UK system at least, are predominantly land-based. Um, some are just general things that you might apply to any design, so like thinking hats to help think, or plus minus interesting, or swap to evaluate. And sometimes there's an overlap. But with my interest in permaculture as like a general design science that can be applied to any situation, I don't really want a bunch of tools that, that are there for land. I want tools that help us to think about systems and sustainability in any situation. So that makes the toolkit a little different. So lots of things in the permaculture toolkit are like that anyway. You know, so input-output analysis. You can apply it to a land situation. You can apply it to teaching. You can apply it to a business. Um, thinking about energy use with zones is, you know, is helpful. Um, using carbon footprinting to think about ethics is helpful. So there are a lot, there's lots of stuff that I think is brilliant. Um, from what I personally encountered, there were things that could be improved as well. Um, so again, I was saying before about checking in with the external context. I've not seen enough reminders in permaculture to do that. In business sort of type analysis, you need to think called PEST or similar to think about the political, economic, social, technological things happening around you. So things like that, I think, could be helpful. Um, we talk about making base maps, which for me, is not so systemic as talking about mapping the base system. You know, we're meant to be interested in relationships, getting out of that thing about just thinking about the elements, but we tend to just draw a map, and that may not also include the analysis of what's happening there. So I think moving more in that direction will be helpful. And tools are very conscious processes, and certainly the way I was taught, there wasn't enough focus on the unconscious. You know, the way people design in the real world is an interesting mixture of kind of focused, concentrated analysis or interaction and just having a bath and having an idea and you've solved it. And so more wisdom around when it's time to concentrate and when it's time to go for a walk, when it's time to ignore the design for a week and see what emerges, I think is helpful as well. So I kind of wanted to add more tools like that. Finally, processes. So. Often that is taught in quite a linear way. Just a quick show of hands. Who's heard of sediment? That's an unusual word. So most of you. Again, apologies if this is unfamiliar. Um, so often we're taught using these kind of acronyms of stages. Often it's explained as a linear thing. Um, there are different approaches emerging. So Luke McNamara has a thing where, with a design web where you just you touch upon different parts of a, a web of design. Same question, are they systemic? Are they helpful? Um, I read a really interesting book this week uh, about how people actually design, not theories of how it should be, how do people actually do it. Um, they, t they tend not to follow a linear process, right? Um, there's an enormous amount of diversity, so one thing is a personal thing. Another thing that's very common 
is that people tend to flip between the problem and the solution. You know, you're given a problem, you might have an idea, and then you go, oh, wait a minute, that generates, that doesn't quite work. But then you have a better understanding of what the problem is, and then you try engaging with that and come up with new ideas. Often it's this dance between problems and solutions, and that rings really true, actually, for me. And I've seen a lot of people doing diplomas struggle as they try to fit what they've actually done into these processes that don't really describe what they've done. Um, so I think grounding how we talk about design more with what people actually do is helpful. And there's a lot of different ways for that. So for me, it's not about having a process that you follow, but it, it can still be helpful to have something like a checklist where you know, at some point you will do some observation. At some point you will do uh, some ideas for what the system will be. So you know, pause and have a look. Have you done this? Like as a checklist, but not as a process to follow. Um, okay, I'll leave that there. <laughs> okay, I'll be super quick. Um, is our process is systemic? I think to a fair degree, lots of things are good. Uh, I found, especially for the designs I was doing, that lengthy observation and planning was often not what was needed. Often what was needed was starting to interact with the system, observing, responding, adapting. So there's a bit of kind of design wisdom again about knowing the situation you're in and using a process that fits. Um, I'll not go through that because of time. So back to my original questions. Is there such a thing as a generic way to design sustainable systems? I think, yeah, there is actually. There is a lot uh, that can be done that's generic. And does permaculture fulfill that role? In a lot of ways, I think it does. Uh, personally, I just like to tweak it here and there, just to make it a little sharper in that, in that way. Um, I'm in the process of trying to map out how I would do it. This was a very first attempt yesterday. I won't go through this, you'll be able to get my slides afterwards because of time. But essentially, I'm, I'm trying to capture that dance between problems and solutions. Um, the principles and ethics I put in green because I think in a permaculture design you have to do that, essentially. Um, I think there's an interesting question around when we consciously and unconsciously design. We design every day of our lives. We don't always do it as a conscious design process. I think permaculture teaching is trying to both help us just you know, embody permaculture day in, day out, day out, and it's trying to empower us to do conscious designs. And I think they're a little different, but similar things will happen. And I wanted to just include a little bit about how this relates to teaching, because that's the theme of this session. So I've just been very fast and theoretical, <laughs> um, and not everyone will connect with that, and that's fine. Um, so I wanted to consider two aspects of, of teaching, so how we might teach design, and also if you remember at the start, I was talking about permaculture as a movement, as a worldview, and as a design strategy. So I'm going to think about it as the worldview, which I think is also an important part. So in terms of teaching design, I think Kolb's learning cycle is a very helpful thing to refer to. Um, you know, my journey here is I'm reporting a journey of experience and reflection and some theorizing that I'm sharing with you now, which I'll then go on to apply and, you know, moderate. Um, doing a permaculture diploma, I think, is wonderful for actually learning permaculture in a way that PDC struggles to, to do, I think, because of the amount of time you spend learning by doing, by designing stuff. Um, I think... Yes, and I think for other, you know, for uh, many situations, it could be that the better way of learning isn't through the theory, it's starting with the experience, and then the theory might come later. Um, I'm interested in whether PDCs, if we want to frame permaculture in the way that I am, might focus more on, you know, more time designing and more kind of inputs of theory, and less on the sort of specific techniques of permaculture, the left-hand side of the diagram at the start, you know, less about how we garden and more about design, design, reflect on design. Maybe that's not a PDC. Um, almost there. And teaching a worldview, I think learning by doing is very important there. This is a, a picture of a, of a compost toilet at Shambhala Festival. It's learning by pooing, really. Um, so, you know, 
the compost toilets are there, and there you have like a, a flower bed with the compost from last year's festival. So people who have not engaged with this sort of stuff directly see cycles of, you know, of resource use. Brilliant. We learn by experience in other settings, our upbringing, you know, our lives, our communities, social movements. And so a lot of the worldview stuff, I think, is, is embedded there, not in formal teaching situations. That's, if you get my slides later, you can see things I read that I like. And um, what I might do next with this sort of stuff, I'm interested in feedback now or later. I want to tweak it and share it. I'll probably write an academic article that no one will read. And maybe I'll write uh, something on the internet that people might read and use, and that'd be nice. And I'm interested in teaching with this different frame of permaculture, if that's allowed, because there are rules about what's in the PDC. And going too far from the land may not be permitted. But we'll see. Sorry that was so fast. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, it's um, something very much after my heart. I, I sort of struggle with um, with sort of principles and uh, and people's ability to be able to translate those principles mm. into pr practical action. And I think it's I think it's something that we need to sort of focus on more. Is that there's a lot of people who just don't see permaculture as a design process or don't see it, I think, as well as we need to as a design mm. process. So, questions? Hello. Hi. Were you here this morning for... Uh, I was not Katie? there. Yeah. So, Katie's, Katie Fox's session from Cell Centre for Ecological Learning Luxembourg was really relevant mm. and covered the chaotic approach, this balance between structure and chaos, or yeah. order and chaos, and certainly in my experience in both teaching and projects, that balance is critical, so we need a systemic approach to including chaos, or the yeah. non-linear elements, if you like, yeah. which is perhaps more challenging within an academic context, yeah. but to me that's the key part of how we generate the optimum outcomes, because it's the right and mm -hmm. atmosphere kind of being both valued. There was a connection there with Katie Fox's talk this morning and the chaotic approach. It's my homework to go and talk to her. And I was just saying that it's good to get some, sometimes we, we can't get all the sessions, so it's good to hear about what other people are saying something about the session. But if you do want, there is some seats for forward if you are having a problem with you. Any other questions? Oh, all right, well, sorry? Uh, I, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> good, I'm sorry. Just a good comment. It's a good comment. <laughs> Because it's, it's not from a man, it's for, from other other ways of, of feeling the, the teaching. Because you are bringing a lot of theories, principles, frameworks, uh, tools, blah, 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 blah. blah. Mm. But really, uh, I am an architect. So all this design chaotic process, I am mm. already completely familiar. Although reality, mm. you don't see that. <laughs> the reality is different because it's too, too left uh, bra uh, brain mm. side, uh, but the, the question of intuition and other modes of knowing that are not analytical, mm. they are more uh, like feeling through the body, uh, uh, gut feeling, I mean there are many, many, many uh, layers of uh, getting knowledge for the environment and also how the body feels and seeks uh, with what is in front of the problem interaction with other designers or mm -hmm. clients or beings. Thank you, thank you. Gentlemen um, behind, did you have a question? Uh, just, can we access this? I think yeah. all the slides from the event are being shared, are they not, afterwards? Yes, and the audio and maybe some video. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. good. I mean, if you want to have a word with me after, I'll send it to you as well. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, we might, um, thanks, Andrew. We might yeah. 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 Yeah.
Jane um, graduated, she's actually a, a medical science student. Um, she spent over 10 years working in the national health system, which is good training, um, mostly within the field of mental health. She also studied <coughs> theology, looking at religion and mental health. And 15 years ago, she started gardening, was soon completely hooked, she says. I worked, um, so I studied and worked at the Royal Planning Garden School for three years and then taught horticulture at Hadlow College in Kent. And currently she's working with the Schumacher College. Um, and Jane's presentation Learning by Doing. It's learning, yeah, learning by Doing, and it's based on the work that you've been doing with the Schumacher <coughs> College. So, thank you, Jane. Uh, Classic technical hitch here. Uh, no, that's not it. So which one? Uh, it's not. No, it's none of those. No. Okay. Just close. It was up when I walked in. And do you know where, where, where it, is? it was it was on the screen when I walked in the room earlier on. Uh, I have it on a memory stick if that helps. So IPC UK. IPC UK. Yeah, please. That one. Okay. Thank you. This one. Yeah. Thank you. So hello everybody. Um, I work at Schumacher College, um, and I'll tell you a bit about Schumacher College and what we do there, and also talk particularly about Schumacher College's uh, philosophy of learning. It's pedagogy. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Schumacher College is part of the um, Dartington Hall Trust, which is based in Devon, very close to, you, Totnes has been mentioned a few times already this morning. Um, it's very close to Totnes, that's the nearest town. Um, the estate itself, the ri written records date back to the 13th century, and this church tower is 6th century, so it's, it's got a long heritage to it. It did fall into ruin, and then in the 1920s, uh, a couple called Leonard and Dorothy Elmhurst um, bought the estate. Now, Leonard Elmhurst uh, studied agriculture at Cornell University, and he married Dorothy, who was a wealthy American woman, and they poured the energy, the time, the passion, and a lot of money into the estate. Now, Leonard had worked with Tagore, who's an Indian mystic and poet, um, who was very interested in rural regeneration and in progressive forms of education. And when Leonard returned from India to the UK, he was talking to Tagore about what he should do, and Tagore said, do something similar back in the UK. So the Elmhurst's vision for the Dartington estate was very much about creating local economic well-being within a rural setting. Um, to have a progressive form of education, and they set up the Dartington School. And they, have a they did have a College of Arts on the estate, a lot of craft. Dartington Glass, for instance, still survives today. Unfortunately, you're no longer at Dartington. Um, um, and also land use, so agriculture. So they wanted to look at uh, new and better ways of using land. Now, it's very humbling, I think, that some of the things they did we would now frown upon. But of course, they were doing the best at the time. They introduced tractors onto the land, they ripped up hedgerows, and we still have the building that housed the first battery chicken establishment. 
still called the chicken shed, now used for craft. Um, Schumacher College itself is based on the estate. It's part of the Dartington Hall Trust. It was set up in 1990 by Satish Kumar, who was a Jain monk, and then went on to found a, a, a school in Devon, um, a, what he calls a small school. Um, he spoke with the trustees of the estate, including John Lane, who was an educationalist, a painter and a, a, a writer. And they came up with the idea of... Um, a college that would have a holistic way of learning, in particularly learning from nature, that which was very much in line with Tagore's vision. Tagore said that nature was our teacher. Um, they named it after Schumacher. Um, Schumacher is probably known to uh, best known for his book *Small Is Beautiful*. He was a German economist that fled to Germany uh, and came to work for the British Coal Board in the UK. And he's written a lot on the importance of small-scale, decentralised, um, appropriate and user-friendly technology, which today is... Uh, the charity that followed on from that was Practical Action, and they have open-source, appropriate technology. So the college now is an international centre. We have students from over about 70 plus different countries um, that come for, for an education that is based in nature. Um, part of the college philosophy about learning is that true learning always involves a degree of personal transformation, whether that's learning and getting to know a person, an idea, a practice, a technique. This is our lovely building. We're very lucky where we're situated. So there's three pillars to the college learning. One is that it's whole person learning. And um, I'll talk in a minute a bit about the community side of the college, but it's very much felt that the students learn as much by living together and working together as they do by being in the classroom together. Tied in with that is the learning by doing. So, um, and the question that interests me, because I've taught horticulture in other settings, is how do we actually learn horticulture? How do we learn to garden? How do we learn to put permaculture principles into practice? And peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, of course, we have plenty of uh, renowned external tutors that come through the college, and there's, there's college staff themselves. Um, so there's a level of expertise, but everyone is seen as being on their own learning journey and learning alongside the students. And the students are very much encouraged, um, as much as possible, to come up with their own ideas and their own solutions. So it, it's about trying to, if you can teach a way of thinking, it's about rather than what to think. It's a moving away from this um, concept in education of there is a correct answer, um, there is a right way to do things. So like I say, the college is a community, now it's a transient community because the students come and go, but all the students, whenever they're on a course, are residential. Um, so that means we eat together, we cook together, we clean together, and all of the students, whether they're uh, involved in horticulture or not, all get a time, time to work in the gardens. So we have a daily rhythm to the college, optional morning meditation, a morning meeting, um, work groups, your actual course, whatever that might be, lunch, more coursework, and then evenings usually full of various activities, often created by the students themselves. And like I say, that time outside the classroom, living with one's peers, is thought to be as crucial to the learning as the time in the classroom. This is having pizza by our cob oven in the garden. Some of you may have come across Matthew Crawford. He wrote an interesting book. Well, he's just written a new book, actually. But he wrote an interesting book called... Um, um, paraphrasing it, it has got a long title, but it's something like the importance of working with your hands and why office work is bad for you. 
Um, and this is a quote from him. Without the opportunity to learn through the hands, your learning can remain dis distant and abstract, and your passion for learning is not engaged. This is one of our apprentices from last year, Planting Asparagus. So to come up to the uh, apprenticeship itself, so it's an apprenticeship in sustainable horticulture. Um, it's now in its second year. The college has taught vocational horticulture for about five or six years now. Previously, they were non-residential courses with a local land-based college, and we decided we wanted to move to the immersive model that's practiced within the rest of the college. So the horticulture apprentices live at the college for six months, covering what, what the best of the growing season. Very deliberately, it's weighted to more hands-on practice than theory. Now, I'm not saying theory is not important. I think theory is important. But it's uh, that question of how theory feeds into practice and practice into theory. So there's, a, on average, a day a week in the classroom. Uh, and I'll show you some of the subjects we cover during the theory sessions. Three days a week are spent in the college gardens, which are in the process of expansion. And then a day a week is spent on the estate as a local community supported agriculture project and market garden. The teaching does <coughs> include the permaculture design certificate, and we have a Rania and Claudia Mangul and Tess Wilbert come along and teach the apprentices the permaculture design certificate. Now, the joy of the fact that we're expanding the gardens is that the apprentices get for the last two years they've had a they've had a clean slate to work with. They've had a, a pasture a bit of pasture to convert to cultivation. Um, and they know that what the, the ideas that they come up with, with their designs, obviously not all of them, but many of those elements are actually included in what we implement on the ground. Which is very different from some of the horticulture I've taught, where if you learn how to plant a tree, the tree is dug up and reused by the next student to plant the tree. And the, trees never actually stay in the ground. And it can take away from the meaningfulness of the exercise for people. Um, the basics of horticulture are taught, okay? So um, we like the apprentices to have a bit of horticulture before they come, a bit of growing experience. Um, more importantly is, that, is their attitude um, and the commitment to sustainable growing. So seed sowing, propagation, planting, harvesting, soil care, composting. We have a lovely session on scything. Um, I don't describe the gardens as permaculture gardens. Now that's partly because I didn't come to sustainable horticulture through permaculture. Um, I met permaculture later and... Uh, I think it has, it's of immense value, I'm, I'm not saying it's not at all, um, but I don't limit the description of what we do in the gardens to, to permaculture. Um, we also use the principles of agroecology in the gardens, and we're very lucky that we've got Martin Crawford's mature forest garden next door to us on the estate, so the students get to learn a lot of, about agroforestry, and particularly forest gardens. Synergistic agriculture, I don't know if uh, some, some of you may be familiar with it. Um, um, well, I'll talk about it when I show you that garden. Apologies if people know this already. These are the principles, or one distillation of the principles of agroecology. Um, very familiar to any permaculturalist. Recycling nutrients, keeping uh, nutrient availability within the system building soil, trying to minimise your losses of water or sunlight or energy, um, maximising diversity for resilience, again I'm preaching to converse on this, um, and promoting beneficial interactions. These I certainly don't need to introduce to you, these are the um, one version of the principles of permaculture. How am I doing for time, by the way? Um, I want to talk a little bit more now about, about the actual approach to learning, the pedagogy. 
But um, within this, this, these principles, um, draw your attention particularly to responsiveness, so to creatively use and respond to change, the ob observation and interaction, um, pattern recognition, so designing from pattern to detail, and integrating rather than segregating. And what that means to learning. I'd be very pleased. Kolb is doing well at the moment. So he's second mentioned in, in half an hour. Kolb was an uh, American educationalist um, who looked into and wrote a lot about experiential learning, so learning by doing. The idea is that you start off, well, you can in theory end this cycle at any point, but start off with concrete experience. So the actual practice of doing. And of course that engages your mind, but it engages the, your whole person. Then, take a step back, which isn't seen as a separation as such, but, but a, dis a distancing, but in order to reconnect. Okay, and allowing, allowing space for reflection. It's like developing a third eye, looking down. From that, maybe coming up with new concepts, new ideas. And then taking those back out into what you're doing. So that's the cycle. That's my simplified and probably not very specialist understanding of that cycle. <laughs> But it gives a nice, um, what, I, what I struggle with, and I think probably a lot of people who teach struggle with, is how much, of it, how much of it is due to the theory, how much of it is due to the practice, how do those two things interact, and how do people really learn, and how do we get to know. We suffer in the West from uh, a very uh, overemphasis on the rational and the analytical, the linear, the logic. Now, of course, they're important things. We, we wouldn't be where we are today without them. Um, so I'm not saying they're not important, but the balance, and it's very much favoured in current education, is towards that type of thinking, that way of knowing. What we try to encourage at the college is this notion of whole person learning, where there may be a different way of getting to know. And so rather than measuring and calculating and abstracting and standing back from, it's more in the arena of meeting, engaging with, being open to a certain amount of vulnerability, if you like, towards whatever it is you're trying to get to know. I should say here also that within the holistic science and within, um, I, have, I realise now I haven't mentioned what we actually teach alongside the horticulture, we have four master's programmes. One is holistic science, one is economics for transition, uh, sustainable food systems master, um, ecological food systems, so sustainable horticulture and ecological food production at master's level, and ecological design thinking. Possibly coming up with a fifth on arts and ecology. Underpinning that is, the, is, is a lot of the work of Goethe and his phenomenology. So again, how you meet and interact with the object that you're trying to get to know. And how, if you don't see it as alive, those of you that went to Jonathan's workshop yesterday and thinking like a plant, I think he was getting at a similar sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That movement from meeting something as another living being. And how we're dominated by a very, uh, what Jonathan referred to as a mineral approach um, to, to knowing stuff. Because we see it as stuff. Without some sort of space for uh, reflection, observation, something that's got quite a meditative quality to it, then a depth 
of meeting and the depth of interaction can't take place. So one of the things that's encouraged at the college within its very busy schedule, I have to say, is trying to facilitate a certain um, contemplative approach to knowing. Uh, Arthur Zines is a professor of physics and uh, is one of, I think, the co-director of the Centre for Contemplative Minds, which looks at this approach to knowing. And he says it was at the time of the Reformation in, in Western history that um, this sort of contemplative, uh, meditative approach was divided from the then dominant intellectual natural philosophy approach and put it within the ballpark of religion. And he suggests that we need to bring it back in and not just leave it to, to religion. Two more minutes, okay. I realise that, okay. Oh, gosh. Okay. Essentially, this is a recap. Like I say, it's a moving away from the analytical and the logical to a being with. Barbara McClintock was a geneticist that did a lot of the work on genetics of corn, and she emphasised the importance of the role of imagination in many of her discoveries. Einstein had a similar approach with his imaginative experiments. Um, she used to imagine what it was like to be a corn plant. Okay. Um, gosh, I've left you no time to actually talk about what we do on the horticulture, but this is a um, synergistic agriculture garden that we've created, so it was pasture, well-known horticulture, um, permaculture technique of sheet mulching, we grew potatoes and squash in it the first year. Then we did it one and only dig, because we try as best we can to do no dig or at least minimum tillage at the college. Um, and then we created this garden where there's no, very little crop rotation. It's a polyculture. There's no or minimal external inputs. No fertilizers are added. Um, it's based on the principles of Amelia Hayslip, if, if you want to know more about that. Um, who based her work on Manasova Fukuyoka's natural farming. This is the students learning scything. Uh, and this was a beautiful example of, of learning by actually doing, particularly when it came to tool care and the peening and the sharpening. This will be an agroforestry field. So we got this field in October. Um, we're going to practice some alley cropping in there, create our own f food, forest, uh, forest garden, and a craft and cut flower garden, so to pr produce cut flowers for the college, but also craft materials for the craft courses that are run. This is our, one of our three, we now have three wildlife ponds at the college, and uh, this, when it, when it, at the moment it's in quite an exposed public space, but as the trees grow up around it, it will become a more secluded, more intimate space. And one of the spaces that we try to create in the gardens to aid contemplation and meditation, as well as all the beneficial wildlife, obviously. Because um, the formatting's gone in this. This is just a nice quote from Tobin Hart, who was a, a psychologist in Georgia University and looks at children and adult spirituality. He says, we need to travel past points of certainty. So again, moving from the idea that there is a correct way to do things, a correct answer, to meet the world in a fresh way. There's Arthur Zions again, uh, what he sees as the seven stages of contemplative inquiry. So trying to get to know something through this contemplative stance. Was that my 20 minutes? Yes. Yeah. Um, so respect, gentleness, intimacy, vulnerability, meeting or participating and interacting with. And that leading to transformation.
we tried to facilitate that on the sustainable horticulture. All the apprentices got to make their own journal, uh, the book binding uh, on the, on, that's done on the estate. So they made a journal. They have been encouraged to keep it. Whether they have or not is another matter, but they were certainly encouraged to do that. We have fortnightly check-ins um, where people talk about how they're doing, where they feel they're at with their learning, and what has been their most valuable learning experience. Um, each student has their own area of the garden to be in charge of um, and that gives a certain amount of solo time as well and projects so I need to stop, I can see <laughs> um, one of the projects was mushroom growing at the college um, yeah. and we also aim to have some fun <laughs> We have, we're only in our second year of running this scheme. Uh, we, this year we had 10, last year we had 7. And, and what is the cost for the students? It's uh, an apprenticeship in sustainable horticulture. So they, it, it's about sustainable gardening and food production. Yeah. Oh, cost. Oh, cost. Yes. Okay, well, um, it's not cheap. It's £6,000 for the six months. That actually covers uh, food and accommodation only. Um, and all the work they put in, because they, we provide as much of the college food as we can. We're not self-sufficient, but we're increasing the amount of food. Schumacher is very famous for its kitchens as well, so we, and we can feed up to 120 people sometimes at lunch. So um, we're trying to up the food production at the college. So in exchange for the work that the apprentices do, they get the teaching and the trips and the education. Do you have a multi-tier multi uh, price? There are bursaries available, so we do fundraising to, for bursaries. So last year, some of the students got a full bursary. Um, it, it varies depending on the student circumstances and what the funds we have available for bursaries. Um, you talked a lot and very well about the relationship between teaching and learning in terms of the learning arising from much more than the teaching, so the spaces around the experience, experiential learning and the taught learning. I just wondered whether also you found there was a place for crisis in that, given that, for example, Pritchard Capra, who taught, mm -hmm. sort of teaches, actually Macca talks about crisis being about danger and opportunity and whether you sure. find that the students have breakthroughs and they do and making space and that being okay for crises. Yes, you know. no we get it back. You get it back. I don't think any of the principals are actually here, which I'm pleased about because they've got best things to do with us to yeah. talking about. But um the yeah we have had students it, it's quite a tense place to be. Mm -hmm. I mean I'm talking about meditative spaces it, you have to actually work quite hard to to to, to commit to that. Um, because, as I said, there's a lot of courses. I didn't mention there's also a short course program goes on, so there are people coming in and out of the college, often on a weekly basis, so strangers coming in to share the space for a week. Um, so, yeah, the student... Um, and often the students are in transition anyway. Um, so they, they can, we do get people at vulnerable times in their lives for sure. So there are crises that happen. Um, and we do our best to hold those and allow people to come through them. That was really wonderful. I mean, do you find that often very important to, ex you know, to making breakthroughs in learning? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they're not yeah. something that should be feared, that they no. can be no. catered for. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, we take the pastoral care side of it very importantly and uh, uh, there are several ex-students are brought in as bridge roles to, to sort of help hold the space for the students and one of the apprentices always say, well, so far, will stay on for an extra year and be a sort of mentor to the incoming students as well. Okay. Okay. I'm wondering if uh, anything is accredited in the new apprenticeship as 
externally accredited or if the other companies need to work? Yeah, the apprenticeship isn't accredited. Um, uh, short courses aren't. The uh, masters are by Plymouth University. The we like I say we started off with vocational courses that were city and girls courses with the local land based college. There was a deliberate move away from those because we wanted to teach what we wanted to teach. Um, and uh, to have space for that and also to have space for making mistakes. Um, so we try to encourage students to to take on their own projects and for it not to matter if if it's, if it's a failure. Mm -hmm. Stephen Hardy, who teaches the holistic science, uses that term a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah if I understood, your most advanced uh, permaculture course is uh, six months apprenticeship. Uh -huh. Do you know around uh, over the world if there is uh, there are other uh, permaculture course like uh, license or master permaculture course? I don't know, gosh, I'm not the person to ask that question to. Uh, I don't know of a, does anybody know of a license? I, I heard about a new master degree in Australia. Right. And there is a information in the area of Australia. Right. I heard about, uh, I heard about an online, online master degree. Which, which organization?
teachers in the Schumacher way so that we can almost repeat that in all these countries. Yeah, well, we haven't moved on to that. Yes, but um, just to say that one of Satish's big phrases is to go out into the world. You know, it's recognised that the college in some ways can be seen as a place of privilege. But to then go out into the world and to try to create the sort of change that you want to see in the world. So we have people from Colombia and Latin America that are going back out there and creating projects of their own. Um, so that, that's the way we're trying. But I couldn't agree more. I mean, we need to do it, which is just going to be Esta charla es una charla que, bueno, lleva un rato de tiempo, en 20 minutos es un poco complejo poder explicarlo. Um, I'm going to, the, what I'm going to talk about, I think 20 min minutes is a little bit complicated to talk about um, the subject I'm talking about. Más que nada cuando hay una traducción y es más, más <laughs> corto tiempo. Especially when there's someone translating it. <laughs> Entonces, una de las cosas, bueno, antes que nada quería agradecer a todo el comité organizador del IPC que hizo posible que hoy estemos aquí. Thank you very much to all the coordination of the IPC for making it possible for us to be here today. Bueno, a la capitana, que ha estado ahí viendo cómo es la traducción y cómo es poder transmitir esto, que es bastante complejo. And to me for uh, transmitting this complex subject to you Y bueno, yo quiero agradecer principalmente a cada una y a cada uno de ustedes por estar acá. I'd like to thank each one of you uh, for being here. Y porque no están en otro lado. Because you're not anywhere else. You're not somewhere else. Y eso quiere decir que hay algo. That means that there's a reason why you're here. Sí, y de ese algo que no sabemos cómo explicarlo, vamos a hablar. And this, this thing, this something, this reason that you're here, um, that we can't exactly explain is what we're going to talk about today. No sé cómo es. So it's quite complicated. In 10 minutes of the plan. Hay algo que hizo que ustedes vengan hacia aquí. ¿Sí? Que vengan a este momento de teach and learn. There's something that brought you here today to this moment where we're talking about teaching and learning. Entonces, la, la propuesta un poquito de lo que hacemos nosotros es nuestra orientación puntual dentro de lo que es el, el Instituto de Permacultura en Alum, es una nueva metodología o un nuevo entendimiento de los procesos educativos en permacultura y en otros procesos educativos. So, what we're talking about today, our, 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 um, our proposal is to explain the, the, the new ways that we are finding to approach education, uh, the new processes that we're, that we're using at the um, Permaculture Institute of Nalum. 
hace más o menos 15 años que hacemos actividades con permacultura y 26 años que trabajamos en educación. So we've been working with permaculture for the last 15 years and we've been working in education for the last 26 years. Entonces eso nos ha dado una, una posibilidad de experimentar diferentes aspectos y cosas que sentimos que son necesarias cambiar. So we've had the opportunity to, um, to experiment and to um, look at different possibilities that exist and also things that we can change. Entonces, hay algo que hizo que ustedes vengan aquí. So there's something that, that brought you here, something that made you come here. Y fue un pacto. Un pacto. It una firma. It was a, a pact, an agreement. Sí. Yeah. Que hicimos hace mucho tiempo. That we made a long time ago. Para encontrarnos hoy acá. To meet today here. Para este momento tan especial que tenemos. In this very special moment that we have. Y este momento quizás nos damos cuenta de que somos parte del proyecto. And in this moment we realize that we're part of the project de restauración planetaria más grande en la historia de la humanidad. Of the biggest project of, um, of restoration um, for the planet <laughs> in, in, uh, for, for humanity sí. that's, that's ever happened. Y yo no tengo ninguna duda que es a partir de la educación. And I don't have any doubt that, um, about being, us all being part of that. Aprendizaje, aprendiendo, enseñando. Um, learning, um, learning about things and teaching. Ahora la pregunta es, ¿cómo aprendemos y cómo enseñamos? So the question is, how, how do we learn and how do we teach? No tenemos una respuesta. There isn't an answer. Sí, sino que la idea es aquí hacer esa pregunta disparadora para empezar a cuestionarnos ciertas cosas en nosotros y en nosotros. So what we're really doing is asking this question, uh, to start asking ourselves the, the, these questions and see, investigate what the possibilities are. Entonces, hay un planteamiento de un maestro que no está. So there's a proposal from a, a teacher who isn't here. Cuando nosotros creamos un bosque, when we, when we create a, a wood, a forest, estamos pensando a largo tiempo. We're thinking in the long term. Si yo doy una serie de cursos durante un año If I give a series of courses throughout a year, y no pienso en el curso como si fuera un bosque perdón, en la, un, un proceso en la formación del bosque solo estaría dando cursos I would just be giving courses. que quedarían ahí And they, they, they just stay there. y no concretaría el bosque And I wouldn't manage to finish the, the wood, it wouldn't be uh, final. bosque busca perpetuarse. And we're really looking for an eternal forest. Entonces, ¿cómo hacemos para que esto, este proceso educativo, se perpetúe? So what do we do to make sure that this educational process uh, perpetuates, that, it, that it's lasting? Hasta ahí vamos. Does that Perfect. make sense? Yeah. Yo lo voy a transportar a algo, a una cosa. I'm going to go through um, some different things. I'm going to take you on a journey. Take you on a journey. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> es solo un ruido. Para hacerlo más grande.
gente, o sea que nos mueve, nos sacude en nuestra vida y nos muestra que hay otra forma de hacer. No sé dónde está la presentación aquí. Pero no sé igualmente cómo estamos de tiempo porque la presentación nos va a llevar un rato. Pero de tiempo cómo estamos. Nueve minutos. Bien, es que no sé dónde está. Bien. Gracias, repito. Bueno, entonces, la, la propuesta de lo que nosotros veríamos hablar ahora, si es el diseño de espacios educativos basados en la permacultura y la educación viva. So the proposal that um, I've come here to talk about today is um, the tools for teaching permaculture, um, tools for creating, designing educative, educational space based on permaculture and um, live education or active, educa active learning. ¿Por qué hablamos de educación viva si vimos nosotros ese espacio a donde recién viajamos? No había un maestro. So when we're talking about um, live education, we're talking uh, and imagining that we're learning um, in this way, then there, there, there would we'd be in a space where there isn't a, a teacher. El maestro, el espacio está preparado para ser el maestro. The space is already prepared to, to be the teacher. Y esa es una propuesta donde nosotros hoy en día estamos caminando, a preparar espacios con el maestro desde atrás. So this is um, what we're trying to do at the moment, is, um, to prepare spaces where the, the teacher is taking a step back. Annualmente, más o menos, damos entre 20 y 24 PDC. Um, at the moment, we talk between 20 and 24 PDCs. En diferentes... Y esto... Bueno, de modo. Eh, entonces la idea de, de nosotros principalmente es el, el desarrollo de, de diferentes espacios, pero hoy en día para nosotros es importante poder hacer un análisis de dónde estamos parados hoy en realidad en, en torno a la educación. So um, through this process we've been able to do an analysis of where we are at the moment in terms of education. Sí. ¿Cómo vería la educación? de hoy en día, no solo la educación en permacultura, sino la educación que tenemos en escuelas, en preparatorias, en universidades. ¿Cómo la vemos? So, how do you see, how do we all see um, education today? And not, I'm not just talking about um, permaculture education, but all types of education, so schools, uh, perhaps secondary schools, universities, all types of education. How do we see education today? ¿Cómo la ve nuestro corazón? ¿Mi corazón ve bien ese tipo de educación o necesita cambiarse algo? ¿Cómo ve un abuelo indígena? ¿Cómo ve un indígena elderly lady? The education. La educación del mundo de hoy. The education which we have today in this world. ¿Cómo lo ve si es que logramos conectar con él nuestro ser interno? ¿Cómo ve la educación? How does our internal being, our internal self, see education if we, if it is that we manage to actually connect with it? ¿Y cómo la ven las generaciones futuras la educación de hoy? 
And how do the future generations, how do they see um, education? Y aquí un poco el tema es cómo vemos la educación en permacultura hoy. And then also we need to look at the question of how do we see education in permaculture today. Teniendo en cuenta el mundo donde estamos. Taking into account the world that we're in. Y la educación que tenemos. And the education that we have. ¿Cómo hacemos el empalme educativo con los nuevos niños? How do, we, um, how do we begin to link with the new lines of education? Que son quienes van a concretar ese bosque de educación. So that we can create this forest of education. ¿Se va entendiendo más o menos? Es un poco complejo para traducir y... ¿sí? Complex to translate as well. Entonces, <laughs> es cómo nos imaginamos hoy día esa educación que contesta las preguntas del corazón de la abuela indígena de nuestro ser interno de la madre tierra de la generación futura ¿cómo nos la imaginamos? ¿cómo so la soñamos? How do we imagine or dream this kind of education that gives a, a response um, to the questions that our, our hearts are asking to um, the, the elderly indigenous woman to Um, to our internal self, to our hearts, to future generations. Nosotros hemos estado investigando. No tenemos la verdad, pero hemos investigado algo. We've been researching. Um, we don't have the truth, but we've been researching and, and learning something. Con algunas herramientas que sentimos que son necesarias implementar dentro de los procesos de educación en permacultura. With some different tools that we think it's um, useful to use, uh, necessary to use within uh, education and within permaculture education. Y digo proceso porque es necesario verlo como un proceso. And I talk about educational processes because it's important um, that we see it as a process. En donde yo puedo, de acuerdo a lo que quiero, aprender lo que quiero en el momento que quiero. So that I can learn what I need to learn in the moment that I need to learn it. Y eso es sumamente importante. And this is incredibly important. Porque al nosotros empezar a practicar, hacer lo que queremos hacer, cuando queremos hacerlo. Because for us to practice um, learning to do what we need to do when we need to do it. Es empezar el empalme. That's how we start that, that link. De la educación con la siguiente generación. For, um, with the education for the future generation. Hoy tenemos a niños que aprenden a leer y escribir a los cuatro años o a los cinco. Today we have children learning to read and write at the age of four or five years old. Y les evaluamos. And we evaluate them. Pero quizás el niño no tiene ganas de aprender a leer y escribir a los cuatro o a los cinco años. But perhaps those children don't want to learn to read and write at the age of four or five. Entonces uno de los detalles es entender este viaje como un proceso. So one of the details um, we need to be aware of is to see this uh, voyage as, as, as a process. Al cual puedo darle la informalidad o la formalidad que quiero. Alguien preguntó por una maestría. Mm -hmm. no? So we can give it the amount of, well we can make it an informal process or a formal process as much as that needs, uh, as much as whichever is most necessary. So someone before was talking about a, a master's. Yo mismo hago mi análisis de mi pasado, dónde estoy hoy, y proyecto mi futuro educativo. Um, I think about my past, reflect on that, to project towards my own future. Y decreto ese futuro. Decreto, de, de verdad. Make it a lot, make it a okay. ¿Sí? Entonces un detalle importante es que tenemos que empezar a visualizar el proceso de educación en permacultura y necesitamos un diseño de la propuesta educativa de la permacultura. So to be able to design uh, permaculture education, we need to have a, a proposal for design for permaculture education, the way that we do it. Sí, no es una sacudida de la persona durante 10 días, 12 días, 14 días y después nos vemos dentro de 10 años. It's not something that we do um, through, we do over, over just 10, 
years, 10 days, and then um, don't see that person for, for 10 years and don't think about it. Entonces necesitamos entender que es un laboratorio social. We need to understand that it's a social laboratory. Sí. Necesitamos experimentar como proceso educativo en permacultura un rediseño de nuestra persona. So we need to um, experience the permaculture education as a, as a redesign of, uh, of, our, of ourselves. Vemos muchísimas herramientas de la permacultura para hacer compost. So there are lots of tools in permaculture to make compost. Vemos algunas herramientas en la permacultura social. We see some tools um, in social permaculture. Cada vez más. Um, this is something that's increasing. Sí. Pero muy pocas para el trabajo con el diseño de nosotros mismos. But we don't see so much about designing ourselves. Sí. Entonces, ¿cómo visualizamos esa transición hacia una nueva propuesta educativa? So how do we visualize this transition to a new educational proposal or concept? Nosotros hemos estado experimentando diferentes propuestas y hemos diseñado bastantes centros de educación o centros de referencia desde esta manera. We've developed um, various different um, educational spaces using this type of approach. Sí, entendiendo algunos elementos muy puntuales que tendrían que tener esos centros en su diseño. Understanding some very specific points that um, these centers um, or places uh, need to have within their design. Autonomía. Autonomy. Sí. Ser autónomos pero al mismo tiempo estar conectados. So they need to be autonomous but at the same time they need to be connected. Necesitan una cogestión de proyectos productivos. They need a co-management of productive um, projects. Sí. Que generen that generate money. Si no hay, no funciona. Hoy. If, if, there isn't, if, if this isn't there, then it's not going to work. Not, not, not at the moment. Necesitamos entonces ver qué proyectos productivos desarrollamos como espacio de educación. So we need to see what kind of um, productive projects we can develop as part of this process of education. Necesitamos visualizar el espacio como una comunidad educativa. We need to visualize the space as, a educational, as an educational community donde todos estamos conscientes de que estamos en un proceso de enseñanza y aprendizaje. Necesitamos un, un espacio para desarrollar nuestro máximo potencial como seres. We need a space where we're able to maximize our potential as, um, as individuals, as, as, as humans, as people. Con herramientas muy concretas. With very concrete tools, very specific tools. Un diseño ecológico, un diseño de permacultura aplicado al espacio. So, uh, a, a design, an eco ecological design, a, a permaculture design of the space. Entonces, esto es, son algunos de los elementos. Nosotros sentimos sumamente importante el pensar en la siguiente generación, pensar en los jóvenes, pensar en la etapa de la pubertad. ¿no? We think this is really important and we think it's particularly important to think about um, young people, particularly at the, um, at, during adolescence. Y visualizar desde nuestros proyectos de educación cómo podemos extender y ayudar a extender ese proceso educativo con un acompañamiento. And to visualize ways that we can extend this process um, as a process of accompaniment. ¿Usted toma un curso de diseño de permacultura con Nalum? If you take a, a course of permaculture design with um, Nalum. Y tiene todos los cursos de diseño de permacultura que vemos en cualquier lugar del mundo para usted gratis. Yes. Gratis. O sea, das, vienes a un curso y tienes todos los cursos de diseño de permacultura gratis. Después, con and nosotros. You can, if you attend one course, um, one permaculture course at, La, at Nalum, you have all the future courses free. O sea que puede participar en 19 o 20 cursos por año. So you could do maybe 19 courses a year if you wanted. Gratis. Free. Sí. Hay algunas propuestas. Usted quiere algo más formal. So there are some, some different proposals. If you want something more formal, 
Entonces, bueno, venga como un becario, aplique a una beca con nosotros. You can apply for a scholarship with us. Para que usted investigue lo que usted quiere investigar. So that you can do research in something that you're interested in researching. No lo que yo quiero. Not what we want you to research. Entonces, hemos desarrollado propuestas de becas parecido a los, los internos de tres, seis meses generando un diseño integrado entre un cliente, entre el instituto y entre el estudiante becario. So we've um, put together a program, uh, a scholarship program, where um, we develop a program for three to six months um, linking a client, the, the institute and a student uh, who, is the, the, who receives a scholarship. Aclarando que nuestros clientes no son eh, grandes. Just to clarify that our um, clients are not farms. Son personas o grupos que nos piden que diseñemos espacios educativos. They're people or spaces that are, or places that ask us, organizations who ask us to, groups that ask us to design educational spaces. Porque dentro de nuestra línea decidimos no diseñar más granjas, farms, o casas, sino solamente espacios de educación que se transformen en faros de luz. So what we decide, what we've decided is that we don't want to, we're not going to design farms or houses anymore, but rather these educational spaces which become beacons or lighthouses. Y hoy más o menos estamos desarrollando el trabajo con miles de estudiantes en Latinoamérica y tenemos un trabajo más o menos entre 14 y 15 países. And we're working with uh, thousands of students in Latin America um, and we are, are linking with, with um, 14 or 15 countries. But we, we're only, we've only started quite recently. Ahora la pregunta es, ¿nos atrevemos a cruzar la línea? So now the question is, do we dare cross the line? Okay. Thank you. Si alguien quiere, bueno, no. ¿hay tiempo para preguntas? ¿O no? So, y hay un regalito para cada quien. If anybody wants the presentation, Se la pasar y ahí están todos los can pass it on and all the information is on there. ¿Dónde es el proyecto? Eh, where is the project? It's in all different, eh, en muchos diferentes países de Latinoamérica. So it's all over Latin America. Solo proyecto. O sea, tenemos muchos proyectos. Sí, muchos proyectos de nodos, representaciones y centros de referencia. Sí, la luz. Y luego estamos asociados a otro grupo que se llama Alianza Permanecer, que es un intercambio de estudiantes y maestros. O sea que si tú tomas un curso con nosotros, puedes tomar todos los cursos que quieras gratis con todos. So if you take a course with us, you can take all the course, courses with all the other different places that are running these courses free. And it's running in different parts of Latin America. Nalum. Nalum. I was going to try and write it. Can I pass now the presentation? N-A-L. U-U-N. N-A-L-U-U-N. 
tenía una pregunta por ahí. Any other questions? Una, dos, tres. What kind of elements do you do with the adolescents? What kind of uh, activities are the adolescents engaging with? What activities do you do with the adolescents? With the adolescents, and we're talking about more generally. Usually, it's a course of design and permaculture, but with a change quite radical in the methodology. So it's a it's a it's a permaculture course, but with a radical change in the methodology. Y abrimos un programa de becas. And we've opened a, a, a scholarship program. Sí. Para que puedan venir con nosotros a diferentes propuestas. Para que ellos aprendan lo que quieren aprender. ¿Quieres aprender bioconstrucción? Bioconstrucción. ¿Quieres aprender agricultura? Agricultura. ¿Quieres aprender con una mentoría? So they can learn different different kinds of they can go down different lines of learning depending on what they want to learn. So if they want to learn bioconstruction, that's what they learn. If they want to, it depends on their particular interest. Y esto es una red de de centros que estamos conectados y que, por ejemplo, tú necesitas que alguien vaya a tu lugar, entonces podemos armar un programa de voluntariado, podemos armar un programa de becas o podemos armar un programa que llamamos nosotros de perma aprendiz. Yeah, so um, there's a there's a network of different centres that are all taking part in this, and if somebody somewhere needs something, then they can perhaps put together, um, they can get together a group of volunteers who can go and do it, or they can put together a, a scholarship program so that people can work on specific areas. So, so, so what, what are you saying rather than sort of run a PDC yes. and cover all of the elements that are in uh, commonly in the um, the model's design. Sí. Your, 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 it's more, it's sort of self-directed learning. It's more the individual person directing no, their... En, en el, a ver si entendí. Entonces, el, lo que aprendes es autodirigida. No es algo, no, no vas a tener todas las cosas en el currículo o todo lo que hay en el manual de... Sí, el en, el, en, el, en el PDC, sí. En el PDC, sí. Yes, sí. Pero lo único eh, es pensarlo desde otra manera no, no con un maestro aquí sino que el maestro prepara el espacio para que el estudiante aprenda lo que yo quisiera decirle aquí the teacher prepares the space so that they, they learn but not from the fact that the teacher is sort of teaching them what they want to teach them es, estamos haciendo un experimento sí. y está funcionando. So I, I took notes, I, I thought of it as explorative uh, facilitation, facilitación explorativa. ¿Explorativa? Sí, explorativa. Sí. Sí, nosotros met, es un montón de cosas. Hay muchos, si hay alguien que quiere más detalles. O sea, podemos, va a haber un par de talleres que vamos a hacer en la convergencia con más tiempo. Yeah, if you want more detail about this, at the convergence, if you're going to that, there, there, there will be two workshops which will go into this in a lot more detail. Y si hay alguien que quiere más detalles en un rato, yo no tengo problema. And thought, if you want to ask me some questions about detail, then please ask me. One question here, I think. Yeah. I've got a, a dual answer related to two questions. So one is, uh, what is the youngest age you work with? And the, it's also, with when you work with the adolescents, are they, instead of going to school, or is this in their holidays? ¿A qué edad empiezan a aprender con ustedes? Es la primera pregunta. Y la segunda es que con los adolescentes, ¿Van a aprender con ustedes en vez de ir a la escuela o Bien. lo hacen en vacaciones? Recordar que nosotros estamos haciendo propuestas de diseño de espacios de educación. ¿Qué quiere decir? Que esta propuesta es una propuesta para hacer un rediseño de las escuelas que tenemos. So remember that we're, we're looking at um, designing uh, educational spaces. So we're looking at redesigning the, the, the way that we, we learn. No es que nosotros solo trabajamos con niños, con adolescentes y adultos. We don't just work with, with children, adolescents or adults. Lo que sí es entender a los niños. 
But es muy importante poder entender al nuevo niño de hoy. But it's really important to learn about, uh, to think about children, to be aware of children, think about children today. No quiere el niño tener un maestro enfrente. No le gusta. They don't want a, a teacher in front, in front of the class teaching like this. They don't like it. Entonces, ¿cómo hacemos si seguimos enseñando permacultura? So if we carry on teaching permaculture like this, well, what's going to happen? Cuando nos encontremos dentro de 10 años o 15 años con ese niño que quiere esa clase pero no quiere aprender. So in, in 10 or 15 years when we come across this child that doesn't want to learn this way, how are we going to deal with that? ¿Y cómo hacemos esa transición entre el maestro de permacultura, que hoy es, tiene una característica más teórica, a una transición donde propone las herramientas, pero desde otra manera? So how are we going to make this transition from permaculture teacher um, to a teacher who um, finds, um, who, who gives you the tools to learn but in a different way? Esa es como una pregunta, ¿no? ¿Cómo nos adaptamos a, a encontrarnos dentro de 10 años con esa realidad? So this is a question, how do we, um, how do we adapt so that we um, can deal with this reality in 10 years' time? No lo sé. Am I going <laughs> no, Pero lo estamos intentando. Eso we're es trying. importante. ¿no? We're trying and that's the important thing. Okay. <laughs> ¿Tenías otra pregunta? Sí. Yeah. Um, teach with a Spanish friend and I wanted and um, helped him get through to his diploma and to me this has been a really useful session for understanding how you know, the question around how we teach and learn permaculture is very different depending on the language and the culture mm -hmm. and why I love working with my Spanish friend is yeah. it's very different to the English culture which is more left brain and more narrow uh, and it tends to come more from the heart I find you know, when permaculture is taught in Spanish and from that culture. Sí. E ese curso, eso que vieron ahí fue aquí. Eh, no, en Europa, en España, en Italia, la siguiente semana en Berlín, en Alemania luego en Ibiza, diferentes públicos, estamos probando y vemos que funciona. Eso estamos sacando la cuenta, funciona. So, so these courses that we've just seen are, are here uh, in Europe, uh, in different places, uh, um, in, in Spain, in Berlin, in, in Berlin, Italy, Italy, la semana pasada. In Italy last week. Uh, it's Berlin next week, I think, um, and uh, so we're trying different spaces and seeing how it is teaching to, to different audiences. Ahora, ¿cómo hacemos para cuando no hablamos esa lengua? So what do we do when we don't speak these languages? Vamos a un siguiente nivel. We go to the, the next level. Y entonces estamos desde una cuestión netamente intelectual, desde el intelecto, el pensamiento, lo cognitivo, so we're moving from the intellectual, the cognitive, hacia otro nivel, to a different level. Podríamos llamarle, sonó por ahí, creo que lo dijiste tú, intuición. Tú. So I think we can call this in intuition, as the lady has said. Imaginémonos que estamos en una, en un saltarín, en una cama elástica de esa que les gusta a los niños. So imagine that we're on a trampoline, this trampoline that children like jumping. Y por momentos, quizás una vez al año, so occasionally, perhaps once a year, tenemos la chance de que el trampolín uh -huh. nos permite <laughs> y dure una milésima de segundo. So maybe, yeah, maybe once a year, for maybe a fraction of a second, we have this possibility that we go above where we normally go. Y a medida que va pasando el tiempo y nosotros nos vamos trabajando y nos vamos reconectando con nuestra esencia, llegamos a un nivel donde ya no es una vez al año. Ya vivimos en la intuición. Now we live in this Pero es algo que no es eh, tangible 
testeable. It's not something that looks tangible. Entonces, ¿cómo hacemos en una ciencia de diseño para enseñar de una manera que no es tangible ni medible? So how do we um, how do we invent the science of education in a um, that isn't um, tangible or, or measurable? Entonces estamos haciendo un proceso de investigación de esto exactamente. So this is our process of, of investigation. This is what we're researching. Porque está ocurriendo. Because it's happening. Y vamos hacia un camino que es más profundo todavía que la intuición. And we're going along a, a path which is even deeper than intuition. Sí, que es lo que los niños traen. And this is what children have. Y que cuando pasan por el sistema educativo actual es como que mutilan eso que traen. And when they go through the current educational system, it's, uh, it's, it's mutilated. Entonces, ¿a dónde vamos? A la reconexión. So where are we going with this reconnection? Where can we, how can we get Cuando yo entiendo una llave de permacultura, cuando aplico un patrón en el diseño, cuando entiendo las llaves que tengo en el paisaje. So uh, you can begin to understand the, the keys that you find in the, in the landscape learning, uh, through learning permaculture. Sí. Hago que la energía se manifieste, that's, fluya. That's how the energy um, flows. Sí, abro un vórtice de energía para que la plasmación de la energía cósmica se materialice en ese espacio. So it opens a, a, a vortex so that um, cosmic energy can manifest itself, sí. come through and manifest itself. Ahora, ¿cómo busco las herramientas para que la energía, la, eh, para que la llave la vuelva yo a aplicar en mí? So how do I um, how do I find the tools to make sure I can um, reopen use that key to reopen that in myself? Entonces es una transición de una escuela a un espacio educativo para darnos cuenta que la vida misma es la escuela. So this is how we make the transformation to go from the school, the traditional school, um, to using this, these new forms of education um, to realize that life itself is the school un camino a generaciones más adelante no ahora ni a dos años ni a tres sino pensamiento como los abuelos y abuelas siete generaciones so this is a, this is a path that we're thinking quite a long way down the line it's not going to happen immediately so we're thinking like grandparents this is going to happen in generation I have a question we're talking quite a lot in this experimenting and listening and seeing the response. Are you making it impossible to evaluate the results? Si sí, están documentando la investigación que sí. están haciendo ya que lo están, están um, escuchando y viendo, entonces sí. es posible documentarlo? Sí. Mm -hmm. I think the video has shown. Sí. Sure, sure. Sí. Es fotos, videos, texto. Sí. Sí. Porque es algo, lo estamos sintiendo, pero ¿cómo lo expresamos en un espacio académico eh, que necesita ser eh, comprendido? Cuando yo lo siento aquí, por ejemplo, me pasa de llegar a un lugar y no diseño más, porque el diseño ya está ahí. Es muy complejo. A ver si podemos... Ver. Um, I, it's, it's quite, it's, it's difficult to, this is my understanding correctly, um, it, it's difficult to get it across in an academic context when it's actually something I feel in, in, in myself. Um, and the last part, I did, y la última parte no. Y la última es entender de que pasan cosas, por lo menos a mí, que en los primeros momentos diseñaba, y ahora yo entiendo que el diseño siempre estuvo ahí, que hay que descubrirlo, ¿no? There are moments that, that I find, uh, well, this happens to me anyway, that um, I'm designing and then I realise actually the design was already there, we just had to discover it. Es complejo. It's complex. No es <laughs> muy simple. It's not very simple. Es como cuando ves un fantasma. It's like when you see a ghost. No? Y como lo contas. How, how do you talk about it? Actually, 